discussion, we'll talk around the topics of sacrifice, seek, shadows, specificity, and voices, um, and try to understand um, what we can learn from each other and maybe what the essays had in common um, in trying to tackle some of these larger issues. So I'm gonna jump right into it. Um, I wanna start with two essays that I thought had some overlap. Uh, Sharon's essay on sacrifice, Andrew's essay on shadows. Uh, in some way, I think both were trying to uh, address their respective topic through this lens of uh, personal awareness. Um, Sharon, you discussed uh, really a, a great and wonderful length, this idea of sacrifice being what, and I'm quoting now, uh, uh, the most crucial element to social change, right? This idea of sacrifice being that mechanism. Can you explain a little bit more what you mean by that? Well, I, I had been uh, contemplating the idea of sacrifice versus um, just mere giving and donation, donate, donating for some time. And uh, to me, there was this stark difference in what I saw as a social service worker, social services worker in the community um, and working in human services and um, working with people who are under-resourced. There are these, you know, this group of people who are really uh, engaged in helping people and wanting people to persevere and um, to do great things. Uh, and then there are these people who want the same thing, but are willing to sacrifice their own privilege to make that happen. And there's the difference with social change. I mean, if you, the first group are the people who donate and give, and that's all wonderful and great, but social change requires policy changes. It, it requires um, the dynamic of the haves and the have nots to change. And so that therein is it, what I'm saying is we need that sacrificial component in order for things to change. If we if we're just staying at that first stage where people are doing the giving, things don't change. We just continue to give to people who are in need. But nothing really changes from the foundation. And so that's what I meant when we're talking about social change and we want change to take place. We want our community to really um, become that community that not only helps people, but that empowers people to help themselves. Then that sacrifice has to come into play. You mentioned in your essay, the book, The Color of Law by Richard yes. Bernstein, which I've read and thinks a phenomenal book. Yeah. Um, he mentioned yeah. in it that by failing to recognize that we live with a severe enduring effects of de jure segregation, which he talks a lot about, we avoid confronting the constitutional obligation to reverse it. Yeah. What's that obligation in your mind? That obligation is to recognize that it's not as easy as changing um, certain ways that we talk about things um, or being politically correct. We have to, as a society, recognize that there were these people, the African-Americans, I'm just using myself as an example, there was a systemic effort to oppress and divide, okay? And that lingers to this day. Some wording has changed in, in uh, a number of laws. Um, people have changed the way that they talk about it in public, okay? I think we're seeing some different things that are coming out now where um, if, it's, if it's acceptable to say how I really feel or to you know, raise some of these uh, oppressive ideas in public, then some people will do that. But we have to begin to recognize that there is a systemic effort that took place. And so it's gonna take systemic effort to reverse it. And I hope that makes sense. Yep, yep. And, and that reference to uh, The Color of Law, the book, 
um, made me think of Andrew's essay, different language, but I think in an interesting, similar sentiment. Um, mm -hmm. Andrew wrote a lot about, um, well, a brief reference to Jung's shadow self, but maybe more of a reference to uh, what you call the shadow side, uh, which I thought was a really interesting way to flip um, how I had always thought about Jung's work. Um, it's one thing to discuss personal blind spots, which uh, you talked about. It's another thing entirely, I think, to talk about the blind spots of a place or a neighborhood or a community. Um, and guess maybe talk a little bit about the difference between the two and maybe how that has impacted how you've approached some of your work. Yeah, goodness, it's one of those essays where you like write it and you're being contemplative and you're thinking and you're putting it out there and then you got to talk about it and read it and other people have to read it, right? Um, the work was always about trying to figure out how do you transform at a macro, at a, at a micro level. And I, I think doing, doing the work that I had done at NeighborLink for so many years was so much about doing what no one else wanted to do. And so much of uh, neighborhood engagement and development and city work is doing the stuff that nobody else wants to do, or there's no economic incentive in it. And if no one steps in and, and does that, then, then it just moves on. And I think of then what what has changed? Like how does behavior change? Like what what is the responsibility? What's the behavior economics around change? Mm -hmm. And uh, I am ultimately the only one responsible for my own transformation and change. Like what I choose to do is the only way I change. I don't think anybody's ever changed me. Come and said that they were going to change me, and and it actually working without my you know participation in that or my openness or my welcomeness. And so the idea that uh, I kind of take an approach and think about is just the idea that uh, we we bring all of our all of our good, our bad, and different to our to with us wherever we are and in our place. And the beginning of transformation revolves in and around recognizing the things that are standing in our way. And uh, so I think of like a neighborhood or a place as a collection of individuals that bring all of their great things and all of their bad things. And the more that we become aware of like the shadow sides of ourselves, the more that we recognize that the, the shadows play a role in um, the place that we are part of or that we want to transform. And when I think about it in physical places, when we speak in terms and you meet with neighbors about, you know, neighborhoods or particular pockets of community, the conversation and the narrative about what's wrong or what's broken typically are the, the forgotten places, the shadow places, the places that nobody else gets to own, that, that have no owners. And uh, I kind of had this idea though of, you know, really the magic happens in the margins and those shadow places are really the margins in which we think about the, the beautiful places of our community and the places we visit. And I think of like, Matt and what he's created at the B-sides of Women Guitar or some of the small things that happen in neighborhoods is, that tend to have the attention. It was because people took time and energy and went into the shadow sides of those areas and neighborhoods and began the development in those places and began to take a, a personal interest in developing the shadow places, recognizing them as broken places, as places of promise, and recognize like it's not something we have to just board up and hide it's a place that has inherent beauty but has got us problems and we're not going to run away from it we're going to step into it embrace it we're going to address it and we're going to we're going to own it and maybe we'll even develop around the thing that you know made it bad but we're going to improve it along the place and i, I just saw it like from an individual level to a couple of blocks to a whole neighborhood to you know, development, the, the areas that are often forgotten, I looked at as the opportunities of the shadow and what if we address and why and, and what do we think about those things and how do we how do we really own and look at it and own it and figure out what we do with it from there. And I think concert with that, you mentioned um, that the only sustainable pathway to true community development is the pathway that begins with personal, spiritual and professional development of our leaders at large. Um, and I thought that was probably a good sentiment to ask this group, and, um, maybe for anybody that's willing to answer. In respect to that, um, are there ways we should consider how we push our leaders 
uh, and understanding how they should personally sacrifice, seek, specify, voice their journey in maybe a different way than we are accustomed to, or in a different way to help move this discussion forward in a, in a positive way. Yeah, I think I, I, uh, good to see everybody. I, 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 when I reflect on that, Zach, I kind of come back to um, a couple of things that Sharon said. Where there's a there's a move beyond um, from talk to action. I think with that idea of sacrifice, and I think that I can I can when I think about leaders in our community. Um, uh to 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 show that the demonstration of the action and make that the story rather than the words um with a lot of the topics that are in really all five of these essays i think that there can be some breakthrough moments there can be the uh there can be some inspiration that happens there inspiring others to do the same some breakthroughs i think a sense of permission to maybe yeah. um act in a way that uh to, to push against the risk that might come with that. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, uh, I guess the term is the bias for action, but, 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 but making that more of a, of a movement and kind of a contagious thing would be a really beautiful thing. There also doesn't seem to be, you know, and I, I, uh, I do think Andrew's right, you know, um, these are really a culmination of individual stories, personal journeys, and the collection of them is a community, however you understand it. Um, but I think very, quite often we don't measure um, leadership or uh, weird phrases like persons of influence in the same way. We want to judge them by their results, but don't, I think, fully understand or empathize with their journey, uh, partly because we might not be interested, partly because it's scary to share uh, on a public stage. How can that be more of how we understand what we're looking for in leadership or change or um, especially social change, I guess, to Sharon's point? My addition to that is like, I only know the things that, that I've wanted. I know I have problems. I know I'm not good at everything. I'm good at some things. I have my own, my own challenges without being open to acknowledge that I have my own shortcomings as a human, as a dad, as a husband, as a leader, as, you know, whatever, if I don't begin owning into Matt, Matt's, you know, comment of like, then it's up to me once I gain the awareness of whether I'm going to take action. Uh, am I going to go, you know, find and invite other people into, into those areas of brokenness and speak truth and help me understand it and unpack it and journey with me. And, you know, could you, could you imagine having a, a resume of like, you know, showing out, yeah, you know, we we have we hold this level for our leaders of have they are they in counseling? Do they have a leadership coach? Do they have a business development coach? Do they have a you know all of these things that are like helping them see their you know their blind spots in order to to lead effective if we think that you know we all need our our own help in becoming who we who we strive to be but aren't there yet. Uh, it just reflecting on mine about specificity. I mean, I think it's, uh, you know, one of the downsides of speci specificity is it creates risk because if, if what you're trying to do is very specific, then the outcome is typically, you know, measurable. And so I think that can cut across the several dimensions. I mean, I think in theory, we all say we want leaders who are open and vulnerable and set specific goals and set high bars. Um, but then as a group, I think we oftentimes at like a more foundational psychological level level just look for leaders who project the opposite, you know, no vulnerabilities, you know, I, I, and so I, I think, you know, we have to wrestle with that as kind of a, a larger group. I mean, what do we really want in our leaders? How are we, how are we wired from an evolutionary perspective to, to follow certain people? Um, Cause you know, I, I argue that specificity can be a very important tool, but uh, you know, one thing I didn't talk about in the essay is it, it does create risk because any leader who sets an audacious goal that's very specific and then four years later you don't deliver on that goal, uh, you know, you put goalposts out there and it's it's hard, it's it's hard to move the goalposts, it's hard, it's hard to set an audacious goal knowing you might fail and 
Uh, but I think, you know, all the big step forward, big steps forward have often been set by people who did set very audacious specific goals and then achieve them. But there's like a base rate problem for every one that we still talk about because they achieve great success. You know, every Steve Jobs who said he's going to put a computer in a, in a phone. I mean, that's like pretty crazy when you first say it. Now he pulled it off. So he's great. But there's 50 other Steve Jobs who said something else that's just as crazy and it didn't work. And, and they were not remembered or remembered in a very different light. Jake, in your essay, you, you kind of give a simple anecdotal equation that for something to be interesting, it has to be both uh, surprising and specific. Um, and what I found interesting ab about that is, um, no pun intended, uh, is that uh, I think it's really hard for some people, both in understanding ideas that overlap those two sentiments, but also admitting that that's a rare thing, right? That not everything's infinitely interesting, um, but we've set up a culture where um, to be heard means to be interesting, um, but also we've got all these bells and whistles and tricks to make sure no one really understands that there might not be an overlap between uh, the surprising and the specific. Um, why do you think that's so hard for so many people, especially in admitting its rarity? Um, I mean, the, the easier question to answer is why is it so hard? And it's because it should be hard. I mean, like, it, it, you know, I think, I think of like Venn diagrams often when I think about things and like, you know, another way to, another angle to put that is like, you know, stuff that's really astounding to hear or to watch usually meets like two, two circles. Uh, it's unique and it's correct. Now, why should there be a lot of unique, correct things? I mean, almost by definition, if it's unique, it's rare. <laughs> um, and if it's correct, you know, and unique at the same time, that means you have essentially a variant perception that the vast majority of people either don't see or don't share. And so that's like a very, very high bar. Um, so I guess it's, it's somewhat easier to answer why it's rare. The harder question is, why don't we admit it's rare? Mm. You know, I think, I, I don't know that I have a great answer. Maybe other panelists do. I mean, it's probably probably the same reason, you know, you have a hard time telling your seventh grade son, he might not make the NBA, you know, it's just like. That was, that was we, very easy for me. Um, yeah, well, you're, you're, <laughs> wired, you're wired a different way, but, uh, <laughs> you know, I think, you know, it's, it's a lot of times we don't want to admit just how hard uh, certain things are. And, and I mean, you don't want to focus on, I mean, I, I don't want to get pulled away. There's like all this great work we can do across communities, across organizations that don't have to be like, um, you know, super rare or super unique. I mean, there's a lot of very foundational stuff. So I don't want to pull the discussion too much away from that. But, you know, I think the genesis of my essay was just to inject just an idea that like, hey, every now and then let's, let's pull out like something that, that doesn't have to be like a total moonshot, but is like, we can really sink our teeth into like, you know, the example I use, which probably isn't a great example, like, can we teach every eighth grader in foreign community schools to program? Like, that's like a very tangible thing that I think drives a lot of what we're talking about with community development. It's very easily, you know, measured, um, something we can all work towards. And that's something that would be very, very hard. I mean, I don't even understand how hard it would be because I don't work in education. So it's kind of uh, not fair of me to even use that as an example. But, you know, you can quickly say like in, in the realm of like community development, if someone wrote an article saying, holy cow, Fort Wayne, Indiana, every eighth grader in the Fort Wayne community schools can program in whatever, program in Linux or whatever, Java, like, that that's amazing and I think it's like something like that can be achievable if you get a lot of like buy-in uh into the goals so I, I guess like yeah maybe maybe it is rare maybe it doesn't have to be rare it's it's either rare because I'm, I'm kind of rambling here um but you know it's rare either because the idea itself is rare or it's rare because the idea itself isn't that rare but the execution requires a lot of cohesion which was you know, something that, that was, you know, discussed a little bit in the other essays. Uh, but either way, it's, it's hard. It's just really hard. There, there was a sentence in Andrew's essay that reminded me of what Matt and Curtis were focused on. 
he says that we've learned to hide all of the bad and sometimes even the great aspects of our lives because we've learned there's no place for them in our personality muted world, which I thought was a great adjective. Um, um, and Matt, when I read your story, I couldn't help but think of, um, I saw a lecture once by a guy from uh, IDEO. And he's talking to a room full of creative people and he said, okay, show of hands, how many of you can draw? You know, about 20% raise your hand. Well, how many of you can dance? You know, less people raise your hands. And he goes, well, I teach the same course to kindergartners and I can tell you they, they all vote 100% that they can do both. Um, and some way along the lines, we've kind of lost not only, I think, the courage to seek out new skills and identities and personality uh, traits in this personality muted world, um, but somewhere along the line, it feels like systematically we've been told we, we can or shouldn't do these things, um, or you're not as good as you think, or you think you can draw, but you can't, you think you can dance, but um, let me show you what good dancing is. Um, so talk a little bit about uh, the importance of this idea of seeking those experiences um, and maybe the courage it takes uh, to, promote, to promote that uh, desire in others. Yep, sorry, Zach, I was muted there. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I, I think that uh, we live in our fears. Uh, you know, fear, fear maybe is the ultimate four letter word in so many ways because of um, the ways that it manifests itself in our lives and the ways that it prevents us from experiencing each other, for starters, um, experiencing uh, a wider community, um, expanding our minds. And, 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 and that's kind of where I, I think I went with my essay was just if you could, if there was a dial on your um, sense of adventure and you just could move at 10% and all the things that you might experience in this community that we have and if you did experience them um, how that would allow you to better understand your neighbors that you know and your neighbors that you're yet to know um, how it would help you uh, advocate for them um, and I, uh, in the same sense that, you know, Jacob just kind of talked about if there were a community movement around a big idea, you know, I think, a, I think a 10% more adventurous community, if you think about what it could learn and the way they could understand itself and each other would be a, a really powerful thing. Um, and I found that to be true in my life. So, you know, I was, I was thinking about this session today and I was, I was thinking about things that I've done since the, the, publication happened that, that that I really did in some ways because I was thinking I've got to live it now this essay is published I don't want to run into somebody and have them say what do you you know what new thing did you try and I've done some things big and small and some involve uh enrolling in a a retreat that challenged the imposter syndrome that I face in my life I put myself in an environment that I didn't think I was qualified to be in around folks that I thought were smarter than me and more experienced than me and um, more worldly than me. I've, I've gone to a couple of different churches to really push my understanding of spirituality, which is, has been a place of ignorance for me my entire life that has made me fearful of being exposed as being ignorant in that way. Um, I went to a support group that took on my fear of being weak um, with a personal matter. Um, and it's also been as much as uh, just two weekends ago, I um, went to Pride Fest. I'd gone to Pride during the day. It's a little safer to go to Pride during the day or go to the parade. But I went at night when the dancing was happening. <laughs> and I will say that was probably about the most diverse I've seen in Fort Wayne. It was a remarkable thing. I think the whole community should be out for that. And then the next morning I went to brunch. And I'd never gone to brunch. I didn't think I was cool enough to do either of those things. And so it can be little, you know, more, it can just be a little thing or it can be a big thing. But I think that um, we can all experience, uh, uh, you know, transformations great and large through putting ourselves out of our comfort zones and, and trying something new. And maybe then grabbing somebody by the hand and saying, come with me and let's do this together. It meant to that last point, Andrew was talking about how hard it is for someone to change someone else. Have you had experience with your employees, your friends, your family members on 
push, I mean, what, what you do is like, what you talk about is really hard for a lot of people to, to get to that uncomfortable zone. And you've shown like a lot of leadership in doing that. Have you had success helping other people do that? And if so, how did you do it? Yeah, I think the, I think the probably the last thing I said there was the, was the, was the most important one, which is, you know, kind of find a, um, a, a gateway into it with another human that you trust, you know, and to try to encourage that. I mean, each of those things that I, I did the, I did the sabbatical alone, but everything else I've had a, um, a friend that I've expressed this, these feelings to who have, who have kind of welcomed me into their world and, and vice versa and whatever, whatever part of their world that I wasn't in yet. And, Again, that's been a, a really kind of beautiful thing because I think there is so much that we share. We all focus on our differences, but there are so many things that we share. If we start there, then we can kind of jump outside that the Venn diagram, you know, as you said, into the area that we don't know yet. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's been the biggest um, kind of helping hand for me. And I would I would encourage others the same. And uh, I would like to jump in on that, Matt. Uh, being one of the people who, who uh, I, I know Matt through uh, being one lucky guitar with Sarah and Erica and doing things there before the pandemic hit and everything. And uh, I think it starts individually on an individual basis, like these things that you're talking about, Matt, and that Jacob are talking about. Uh, well, all of us are talking about, really. Um, it starts individually, and unfortunately, that has that every individual's every individual's progress is going to be different. So going to the Venn diagram, uh, for example, when you think about the reason languages survive, the overlapping is that little part of the Venn diagram, and those are the languages that survive versus uh, what's left after that overlapping, which is way, you know, when you look at continental aspects of that, you'll see like the reason, you know, uh, this aspect of uh, French survive was because these people were clustered together and they had to be for whatever reason. And that overlapping is what we want to get to. But in the Venn diagrams, those overlappings are, are usually smaller than the outcome, you know, the output of everybody else. And so, and that's because I think it has to start individually, then move out into the community. And and looking at Andrew's piece, I was thinking about uh, the sociological breakdown of some things that we we had mentioned uh, in in uh, some of the classes I had. And this aspect of shadow self breaks down into shadow shell cells, in a sense, too. For example, um, I would I remember having a having these conversations with students and saying, if you really want to get someone to know, if you really want to get to know someone, you have to get all of their friends together in a circle. And all of those friends are very different. You can have your parents, your brothers or sisters, siblings, aunts, aunties, uncles, that kind of thing. You can have your friends who go out to a movie with you. This is the person I love to go out to a movie with. We have a ball. This is the person I love to go dancing with. This is the, the person that I love to uh, kiss on and make out with. All, you know, you have all these different people, but then you also have the person that's there <laughs> that knows all your dirty secrets, that knows all the bones in the closet. And that's the person you really don't want to be there because they're going to they're going to have, as you talk about shadow self, they're, they're going to have this shadow on you that the other people don't know about. But if you want to get to know all, you know, if you really want to get, it's like an intervention of yourself. And this is the one thing about self. You can't lie to yourself. You can, you put, we can put up these um, um, justifications and say, oh, I'm tired or whatever. But to yourself, you can't, you, uh, you know you're lying. And that's that shadow self that uh, Andrew is getting at. But you have to accept that 
be it, uh, you call it the voice, you know, the good voice, the bad voice, that, that voice that, that comes to you and say your friends say, hey man, we're gonna go in here and we're gonna rob this bank. And, and right there, you have to make a decision. You, your, choice, your choice becomes prevalent to the good self or the, or the bad self. And that's a gut, sometimes it's a gut feeling. That gut feeling lets you know, even if you don't know what it is, is letting you know, I'm not down with this. And so I have to get out of the situation. So individually, those shadow, shadow selves, those aspects of getting to, uh, I remember, I have so many different things, just like you, Matt, uh, uh, going out to Ch uh, Channel Lakes and, with my friends and tubing and stuff like that. And everybody, and when I came back to, uh, I used to work at um, uh, ITT, and I came back and all my black friends were like, you went tubing, why are you going tubing? You know, like, cause it was fun. I want, you know, and, uh, or doing like training sessions with kids and big brothers, big sisters, where you have these, um, what, what are they called? They're like, um, um, oh, they're, um, you're, you're 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 like saving each other. You're you're doing these. Um, I forgot what the uh, some of those trust trust based. Trust, yeah, trust yeah. trust based thing. Just falling back or being on these wires and stuff, and having to get everybody across and stuff like that. And seeing those boys step up. Some of them became leaders in that moment where they never were leaders before. No, no, you can't do it like that because if we do it like this everybody's not going to, we have to get everybody across. So do this. Everybody holds each other and they're solving problems right there. So the individual stuff plays into the, uh, the group and community things. And when, get, and when I think about what Jacob is getting at, I think about that there's uh, two types of people. There those who want to be validated and those who want to be validated and right. And how do you get those two types of people together to address what was happening in the community, be it STEM, or I like to say STEAM because I'm an art person uh, as well. And I think that aspect of art plays into giving them even a higher intellectual goal through music, through all that stuff. I always tell uh, students in technical writing, yes, you can program. You can pro you, and they'll they'll hire you for that. But what if you program it, you write it, you write the story, and you do the graphics, and you own everything? Now they have to buy your product, and that's a total different aspect of how we're seeing that. And I think also for some reason we've gotten away. My school, the high school I went to, which is now closed, is called William A. Work, and Work was. I guess he was the guy, Lisa and Gary, who got the schools to break up and divide things into individual classes. So you had uh, government econ, as well as home ec, as well as gym, as well as you know whatever it was. And what you're finding out today is a lot of students are that are 18, 19, 20 are wondering, why don't I know how to cook? Why don't I know how to do this, this, and this? Why don't I know how to balance my checkbook? These are things that I need to know as an adult. And it, for some reason, because of our education system, we've gotten away from those things. And I think that individual plays into that community so that we can get that overlap in that Venn diagram that we need. Sharon, it, it sounds a lot, to me at least, it sounds a lot like others are talking about the importance of embracing discomfort in some way, whether it's a personal journey, seeking out new adventures, admitting good ideas are rare, uh, having a voice. You talk about discomfort, I think maybe in a different way, especially as it relates to sacrifice. But I wonder, now hearing kind of these discussions and maybe thinking through this uh, panel, um, is there a way to separate out personal sacrifice or sacrifice for greater social change, or are they one and the same? Hmm, that's a good question. Is it? Good. That's a, that's a wonderful question. I'm thinking you, you got all of that, my goodness. What? 
<laughs> well, that's my one for the day, maybe. Okay. <laughs> so we're talking about the difference between personal sacrifice and. Well, like when we when you talk about sacrifice, my my understanding is um, part of that sacrifice is is um, defined by discomfort, right? Making me feel the difference between the giving and the sacrifice, right? Is mm -hmm. one feels comfortable and makes me feel good. The other right. may not, right? The other, it, it's got to sting a little uh, mm -hmm. to actually move the needle forward. Um, what everybody's talking about, I think, in some small way is um, the benefits of uh, that discomfort, um, whether it's being honest with yourself and your shadows, um, your ego, and whether or not you're smart or have a good idea, or, or just trying something and, and relishing in the idea that you're going to be horrible at this new hobby. Um, that doesn't seem like the same way to use discomfort that you were using it but maybe it is yeah i'm, I'm seeing actually some parallels there because <laughs> the um the way that um we're talking about discomfort in terms of you know andrew talking about discomfort and uh specificity and and matt seeking um and um curtis talking about giving voice um, in areas where we might not have been comfortable doing so before, those are all talking about the discomfort and the benefits that we experience within ourselves um, to some degree. I'm not trying to, you know, kind of like boil everybody's down, but to some degree, the discomfort that we experience um, in terms of personal change and the benefits that uh, can come from that. Uh, what I was talking about are, you know, the discomfort that we experience in terms of sacrificing for others uh, and the kind of communal uh, benefits that can happen. But I do also think that there is a personal uh, benefit when you sacrifice for others. So it's kind of like the same thing. I, I think that even... Um, with some of the other essays, the more we begin to explore that personal discomfort and experience those benefits, the better the community uh, is because we begin to explore areas and gifts and talents that we may not have tapped into before. And so I think it's, it's you know, the, the phrasing uh, in the essays may have been different, but I think it's, it's kind of all coming down to the same thing now that I kind of, you know, listen to what everyone is saying and, and heard your wonderful summary there, um, Zach, it's, it's all kind of coming down to the same thing is that as we begin to uh, explore ourselves, you know, even those dark places within ourselves and uh, recognize um, some things that we may not have experienced before or wanted to think uh, that lying uh, um, underneath the image or the mask that we wanted to uh, convey or express to the world, as we begin to explore those areas, uh, we can improve who we are. We can improve who we are um, from a moral standpoint, but we can also improve who we are in terms of exploring those things that we might not have thought or tapped into before. And then those talents and skills are available to the community where we serve. And so when I'm talking about tapping into the sacrifice, um, the, you know, wanting to sacrifice for others, that creates a discomfort, but then we also feel this wonderful, this great benefit. And so for me, I'm going to tell this example. I don't really tell a lot of people, so don't tell anybody. I don't <laughs> but for me, one of my um, biggest um, area, or one of my biggest experiences with sacrifice was that I actually donated a kidney to someone. Okay. So, you know, we all have two kidneys and there are people who um, are, you know, go through dialysis or they have chronic kidney disease and, and those does that chronic kidney disease is very prevalent um, or disproportionately prevalent, I should say, among people of color. Um, and so I donated a kidney to a friend. Now, when this idea 
about donation of a of an organ while I'm alive and conceivably one day might need it. Uh, so that idea dropped into my head. I said, this is crazy. <laughs> what in the world would I get? And, and family members said, Sharon, that's, that's nuts. Um, but I felt this compelling call to do it. I, so I am a very spiritual person. And so I felt called by God that this was something that I, I was to do, that I had encountered this person um, not just for that reason, but for that reason as well. And it was, there was some discomfort. There was discomfort, um, you know, mentally. There was physical discomfort because I had to have major surgery, obviously. Um, but once that was done, obviously there was a benefit for someone else once I did the sacrifice, okay? But also it, it propelled me as a person in my own mind, I'm not saying in terms of other people, but in my own mind to another level, because I saw, wow, that really felt good to do something like that for somebody else. That felt so wonderful for me to do that. And I could do that. I, I have the I had the courage to do that. I had the determination and the will to do that. And so I give that example just to say that when we experience sacrifice, okay, when we are the, the one who is sacrificing, then it not only is a service to the person or the people group, because we may not know who that is, that we're sacrificing for, but then it's, it's, it's a benefit to us in terms of who we are. Who, who we are, because th there was something in the shadows that may not have been negative, um, but I didn't know, it, I didn't know that I could do something like that. I didn't know that I had the fortitude to do something like that. And so that was kind of lingering in the background there. But then once I said, okay, I want to do this, then it came to the forefront. And I said, okay, I, I did that. I can do some other stuff. I can do some other things. So it kind of boosted my courage in terms of the things that I could do as a person um in the community and having seen you know specifically like watching andrew's career from the sideline i have no skin in this game um it, it's been interesting to me to see this work from both directions you know hearing the value of uh the benefit a community can have by people sacrificing um, is one way to look at it. The other way is to understand the benefit a community has by a growing number of people were willing to sacrifice and seeing how contagious sometimes that behavior can be. Um, and, and, you know, and Andrew, when, when you talk about some of the neighborhood work, um, and especially when it's done well, it's organic and kind of um, it, it manifests itself in a, in a lot of ways. But seeing people sacrifice sometimes is as important as um, having some self-reflection about your own personal struggles or discomfort is to say, well, if they could do that, maybe, you know, I can do this to, to Sharon's point. Mm -hmm. One of the things we always would, would say, the more, the more that individuals would get involved in serving and volunteering through NeighborLink and the more they made it personal, you recognize that anything that you're doing is far more about your own personal transformation than it is about what you're physically like actually doing. Yes. You're going to, you're helping people. We're building wheelchair ramps. We're helping fix homes. We're mowing grass and all that was important for the transformation or the support of helping someone else. But at the end of the day, time after time, that service and that sacrifice or that willingness to, to diversify their time and, and resources gave them far more a greater understanding of humanity a broader world view what health and means what community means what what being in relationship with others means and what that gave to them in value far outweighed what they would probably say had they spent their time elsewhere doing something else that was maybe more personally fulfilling uh in modern terms they, they couldn't even imagine measuring it and 
and Sharon, you're, you're right on the, the sacrifice. Like some of our communities, at least in our work, is like what, what our communities need is more diversity, more, more transformation. We need more resources moving in, but not just redistributing economic resources through charitable giving. What we need is people resources redistributing. And we want, we want the diversity in, in the makeup. And, you know, I, my wife and I, we moved into a, to a lower income neighborhood and, you know, all mission oriented. And, you know, when we were doing this and like, this is part of our community development strategy as young people. And we, we did that and it was all always important, but the amount of conversations, where are you going to send your kids? What are you, how are you going to go shop? Like it was the alternative path for what many thought was the right direction for our family. And it was certainly a different ladder than, than most people were climbing. And uh, you go alone, but as you as you engage, some some would call that a sacrifice. For us, it was, you know, moving towards what what we felt led to. But the transformation and the benefit, and we don't look we a couple of years in, it's like, oh man, this is this is greatly impacting our lives more than it is about anything else. And it, it began to you know go further and deeper into that. But it is that idea of like, man, if we had more people willing to sacrifice and make themselves uncomfortable and go places where they their hearts are really longing for because that's the other aspect there's so many people sitting on the fence few are like going hard no's and a few are going hard yeses but there's so many people sitting on that fence waiting to be swayed and who's going to push me off and i want that and that's a longing for me but i don't know what to do with it and uh, we need more people there living and inviting more people off the fence towards them into a healthy relational community to where whatever they sense of sacrifice is really being offered for the sake of what they get in the end. Well, there, there feels like there's some agency in witnessing it, you know, like yeah. to, to Jake's point of specificity. If it's one thing to say, I wish people would sacrifice more. It's another thing to have a goal to say, let's see how many people we can get witnessing others sacrifice, right? And understanding that that might be as useful of a metric as just this wishful goal of more. I, I think I think it goes, you know, deeper than, than witnessing. I think Sharon wrote in her essay about empathy as opposed to sympathy. And that, mm -hmm. that resonated with me because, you know, th there's been literature about like how people identify with different tribes, you know, and I was thinking about uh, Sharon's essay. I mean, I have two little kids. And if uh, I don't know how many of you have, have children or if you've taken care of children, I mean, there are like sacrifices at time, you know, if nothing else, like they, my two don't sleep very well. And uh, my wife would be mad that I'm complaining about it because uh, she gets up more than I do. But, uh, you know, I think, you know, I don't, you don't even think, even though it, I technically probably is a sacrifice, you don't think of it as a sacrifice because you're so closely integrated so empathetic with your children that it you don't even think of it in terms of like your loss and their gain you know I think part of the issue is you know within community development like the wider we can make people feel like they're part of a community um it, it's like a different lens almost to, to see through sacrifice you know and it's it's almost like if someone said you know I I did a kidney transplant because my wife needed one like that's people would understand that right away. Now, if you said I did a kidney transplant because I saw a sign on the road that someone needed a kidney transplant, I never met the person I just gave my kidney. That's like, oh my gosh, you know, like, so like, how do we think through that spectrum of like those two sacrifices, they're both sacrifices. You're doing the same thing in both instances. In both instances, you're giving up your kidney, but obviously they're, they feel very different, you know? And I think, you know, this idea of witnessing or what Andrew did at NeighborLink or, the empathy that Sharon was talking about, or, or uh, you know, talking about voices and new experiences with people, it's like trying to widen the group that people say, "Hey, I feel a part of this community." So, yeah, I guess technically it's still the same behavior; it's still sacrifice, but it feels like you know, part of my family that that I have this empathetic connection now that really spurs action. I, I think that's that's really important. Matt, I thought of your essay the other day. I was. Um riding down the street listening to NPR and they're interviewing Daniel Kahneman, the behavioral economist. Um, and they asked him what I thought was a really difficult question. He had a hyper quick response, which you know said, okay, he's thought about this before, which caught me off guard. They said, if you were given the choice 
would you want to make people happier or reduce misery? And his response immediately was, oh, reduce misery. Uh, and it kind of caught the interviewer off guard. And he said, you know, why? And he said, what you'll find is if you spend all your energy trying to make people happier, you only make happier people marginally happier. If you really want to make a difference, you'd be focusing your efforts on trying to reduce the misery of others. Um, and sometimes I think we get uh, obsessed with this idea of happiness, especially in a community development kind of conversation, right? Let's make people happier, happier, happier. Um, and we don't really want to talk about reducing misery or sacrifice, right? You, these are much harder conversations. Talking about happiness seems a lot easier. Um, but you and your essay, another, I think, phenomenal book is Mahaley's book on flow. Uh, and one of the reasons I always liked that sentiment is happiness is part of the equation, but it's not the metric of success, right? The metric of success is being engaged almost at the limit of your ability, uh, right there at the edge of the cliff of whether or not you're going to be, you know, out over your skis, um, doing something that you think makes a difference and staying engaged um, as long as, as possible and understanding and meeting those challenges head on. Um, so that idea of flow, I think, is interesting, not only to your sentiment of seeking, but in this conversation of not as much sacrifice, but as much as purpose um, and trying to understand where we think we'll be uh, feel the most fulfillment in that discussion. So I guess maybe tell me a little bit in your mind why that reference to flow was important to, to, to you. Yeah. Um, it, 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 I'm glad you brought that up and it's, it's, it's so good and worth studying over and over again. I think one, one thing I think with uh, happiness as with all things, uh, this too shall pass. Right. And so you know, when you think about what Kahneman had to say there, um, I think there's such depth in his wisdom with that. And I, I kind of think about, um, you know, back to what how Sharon kind of opened for us. Um, and in her essay, which I think should be required reading for this community. Um, but the there's a sense, I think, as a donor, as, as a donor, that there's, uh, and there's such uh it, it's it's such a great thing to be a donor and a supporter but you are in a certain sense you can you can you can buy your you're kind of buying a little bit of happiness by becoming a donor in a way or buying paying off some guilt maybe compared to making sacrifice sharon and that was the epiphany for me in in, in your work and in the way that you so succinctly reiterated that core truth that i think we all know to be true but maybe don't spend enough time thinking about um and yeah, I think that um, you know that that is when you when you uh, talked about Kahneman on NPR, there, Zach. That's where I leapt to from from this idea of happiness. Is um, you know part of seek? You, you could make it about quality of life and experiences and and the adventure that is out there for all of us, but you could also make it about the depth of this world and um uh the entirety of it in the way that um the common good um is where maybe the real richness is and and to think of it in that way i think can um, right. just propel the the meaningfulness of it all well, I, uh, I think expanding your worldview isn't just about pleasure like Expanding your worldview is to better understand those around you so you can be a better, more active human. And sometimes that's painful and understanding. And a lot of times that reveals more about who you are, how you were made, how you're ingrained in the way that you may need to think differently about or interact in the world differently with those around you. Is what I kind of take away from what you're saying there, Matt. Yeah, and in, in some odd way, happiness might not be the top three most important metrics of whether or not uh, you're doing something worth doing. Well, I would just say too, happiness, sadness, those type of things are feelings that are abstract versus I would, uh, in, in looking at the question that uh, you said he posed, that he answered an aspect of misery, I look at it more state of mind. Is my state of mind healthy? Because if my state of mind he is healthy, 
then when I'm sad, I know the sadness is only going to last for so long and there's happiness around the corner. Uh, versus if I'm happy, the same thing. I'm happy at this moment, so I better enjoy it while I can because sadness is around the corner. So how is my state of mind? Is my state of mind healthy? And so I really, when you said that, I, re- I, w- I, I chose misery and I was like, is he going to say misery? Is he going to say misery? And it's like, yeah, because I, that, at least that's where I'm at. And so when we talk about, like, I also saw something in Sacrifice that Sharon's uh, talking about. I said, I saw it as uh, allies, allies on paper versus allies in everyday life. The allies on paper, sometimes, and it's good, we, we do need financial things to happen here and there and, and that kind of thing. And some people can only give that way. But the people who do it every day, for her to be there in that room, uh, exchanging things with the person she's giving a kidney to and having the most un- probably uncomfortable aspects of her life happen and, and play out at that moment, but then have this connection with that person. She has a part of her and somebody else. Somebody else has a part of her, has, has taken something from someone else and put it in them. Those are intangible it's just like i don't even how do you even deal with that and like uh andrew is talking about yeah a lot of times the most uncomfortable things that we're in can make us the better people that we want to be well i i'm confident we could do this for another hour but i also know that um i need to let you get back to doing the good work that you all do um, and I don't have an authority to say this, but on behalf of uh, the community, I just wanted to thank you guys for um, not only spending the time to sincerely think through this in your own respective ideas, but to steal Matt's language, kind of seeking to understand something in a real and kind of transparent way, right? And, and share that journey um, with 19 other uh, peers. So um, from us, thank, thank you very much. It, it, it meant a lot. And I think it showed this community what kind of leadership it, it really has and, and what thoughtful discussions can and should continue to, to happen in our community. So I just want to thank you for that. Uh, thank you for participating in this. Uh, and I hope it's not the last time we have this discussion.